Welcome to Norse Talk, Information of the Gods. I'm Red Bearded Viking. This is Red Dranger, and we are here to learn. So, guys, what we're doing tonight um, is we're opening up the second chapter of the Astra, going over the brief history in the Astra. Um, just remember uh, to go ahead and check out our IG pages. Uh, follow us on the cord on my Beacons page in the link. That will get you on the cord to answer your questions. Um, put them in there. So we can get to those at the end of the show. Also, guys, to keep this going, we do need support from our pioneers. So please remember there are three support uh, three support tabs on my Discord, um, or not my Discord, on the Beacons page. Um, the first, top three are for support. Every little bit helps you guys because we want to keep doing this and we want to be able to do some fun stuff for the Friday night episodes um, that are going to require us to buy some stuff. So we do need that support to keep this going, guys. Um, other than that, hi number one, hi number two. <laughs> um, so, like you said, we're starting on chapter two tonight. Chapter two is about history, so I wanted to start off by posing um, a question to Randy, and that is, why does the history matter? See, that's that's a great question. Um, for me, the reason that the history matters is something that we have briefly discussed already is there is no one book that is all knowledgeable. Um, it is definitely a work of homework. Um, and in order to do that, you have to know the past. You've got to know the history. You've got to know where it comes from. Um, you've got to learn about the history to understand why they practiced the way they did and what it means to be a Norwich pagan or a heathen. Because without the history part, you have no basis to go by. That's awesome. And, you know, the thing about history, especially in, in, in Norse paganism, is looking to the ancestors and looking to the past is a huge way of paying our respect to the people that came before us and looking at how our, our, our own paths are going to play out in front of us. You know, the his, history in the past is the best predictor of the future, and that's why it's important. That's why they paid so much attention to this. Um, she, the author's done a really great job on this brief history part of the book by not just talking about um, when the Norse and the raids started happening, but going back even further than that and looking at to where the, um, the, the original culture started forming in the first place when it came to things like sun worship, um, uh, cattle worship, that kind of stuff. And it's, it's really well written. Um, the author talks about uh, a term she uses often in this chapter is Proto-Indo-European. And that kind of references a point in time where a lot of the beliefs were starting to form and a lot of the different cultures were starting to form along the continent, um, including what would be the Germanic parts of the continent compared to further south where Rome and, and Greece and, and those cultures were coming together. So it's, it's really cool because all of those cultures interacted with each other during the development of all these different practices and leading up into the conversion period when Christianity started really kind of playing a role and spreading across the continent at that point. Right. <clears throat> So being that this is Norse talk, we are going to be concentrating more on that part of the development and the most, so it's often, and, and you'll hear this when people talk about Roman history a lot too, you're going to hear the word Germania, which was a large portion of the continent um, north of where Rome, Greece, and a lot of those bigger civilizations were at the time. And, uh, Germania was uh, where you're going to see the languages Old Norse showing up, Anglo-Saxon, which um, ended up becoming a, it was a big part of the form, formation of Nor Norwegian. Um, it is where the Icelandic languages came from. And a lot of all, all of those different languages actually came together and formed a lot of the English language that we're speaking now. And there's a, there's a lot of really cool information out there where you can actually look back and see how all the words started blending together and how all the cultures and, and practices 
they started bonding these words and these languages to bring people together. So it's, it's right. Kind of really. Cool. Yeah. Cause I mean, it, it even talks about um, the Greeks in the next paragraph um, and the different Greek gods and how they tied in with some of the Norse gods. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's another really cool thing about paganism in general is that you can see a lot of similarities in different beliefs and practices amongst even modern paganism <coughs> in the different aspects of it that exist now. There's still a lot of common commonalities there, and that's really cool. So um, when we're talking about the rise of Germania and the start of kind of like the Nordic ways, I just want to make sure that we, we've gotten the time period right here. The, uh, the Nordic and Northern Bronze Ages, which is the beginning here, um, occurred roughly between 1700 and 500 uh, BCE, which uh, in this book, BCE stands for Before Common Era. So if you hear us saying BCE, it's Before Common Era. If you hear us saying CE, it's Common Era. Yes. Um, so this, this chapter spends a lot of time talking about Sunna, which she was a very early adaptation of offerings and, and paganism because she represented the sun. And in almost every basic faith, sun worship was a huge part of the building blocks. You know, it was it was light and dark. It was it was gray and black. It was, you know, lights on, lights off. It, it meant something. It affected the crops. It affected what you could do that day. It was a huge part of day-to-day -day life back then. Um, there is a, a really cool paragraph in here um, about an artifact that was discovered in 1902 in a bog that was dated back to the Bronze Age. And it was a chariot that some people speculate was built in honor of Sunna. And the really cool part about this little paragraph here is the construction and effort that was put into this chariot that was discovered though it was Bronze Age, had aspects of it that were highly more technologically advanced than, than what was going on back then, the spoked wheels and stuff like that. That didn't right. exist during the Bronze Age. So that was a really cool fact too. And that's what led people to believe that this was something important. They put a lot of effort into this thing. Right. Um, and just to remind you guys, the, the reason why the chariot is important is because Sana would ride her chariot across the sky in the sun and it was it's cool and there's still a lot of people that their deity is sun and there's, there's a lot of practices and offerings that that happen with that sorry again, like uh, I said, guys, I'm, yeah right um let's go into the the roman european aspect of it um with the whole julius caesar crossing the rhine river um, yep. in the Germania, which is roughly around the 55 BCE era. Uh, yep. This is uh, what it talks about the military successes um, is a lot of what it talks about in the Grimeric tribes. Um, and then later um, down in 98 CE, um, it goes into uh, the book describing what they knew and had experienced regarding the different tribes, which was some of the first documentation because of the fact that, you know, um, we all know that the Norish did not document stuff. Um, they told tales back and forth, and that's how their heritage kept alive. They didn't actually document it. So this is talking about some of the first documentation um, that came from encountering some of the Norsemen. So after we get in, uh, after 98 CE, when they're talking about the Romans and the, them crossing the, the Rhine and, and moving into Germania and documenting everything that took place about that, um, the chapter skips forward again to where the Bronze Age starts to fade out and the ad adaptation of the Iron Age started developing, which again is a giant leap forward 
for any civilization because what you can and cannot build with prawns and iron are very, very different. Yeah, I mean, it, it led into it led into the from bronze swords into the iron swords, um, which yeah. were a much harder material um, and uh, did a lot more damage a lot quicker. Uh, didn't go yeah. dull as easily. Yeah, well, and, and not just weapons, but tools. You know, yeah. the the ability to have a, an iron tool to use for crafting stuff was very different than the adaptation of, of using a bronze tool. So that changed the construction quality and availability of what they could and couldn't create and started spreading everybody's reach a lot further. Uh, right. And, and that was like some of the first advancements that you guys started yes. seeing in the different periods um, yeah. with the advancements in their technology. Yeah. So the uh, Germanic Iron Age... They have it taking place from 600 BCE to around 800 CE. And this is when they first start talking about the um, conversion period. And you're going to hear this term a lot more as the chapter goes on. The conversion period was, in essence, the rise of a mono deity. And Christianity would be the example of this one. It was a change from paganism to a different form of faith and how it started moving along the continent yeah because it also like it, it goes into uh their germanic iron age um is also around the same time as the rise of the christianity um yeah. and the migration of the different uh germanic languages from the tribes down from the north and spreading them through europe uh, yeah. which is when stuff started getting more documented was when it started spreading through Europe because um, a lot of the documentation was done by Christians. Yeah. Yeah. It was done by non Northmen basically. And that's, yeah. that's why, that's why we say there's so much speculation um, and why so many of these different books say so many different things is because they were all witnessed accounts that were recorded in each particular civilization that have been now passed on through thousands of years. So everything kind of translates a little bit different. Yep. I mean, even just specific words uh, can translate to mean something totally opposite of what they were intended to mean. Yeah. Um, there's a really cool fact and a lot, a lot of, well, right across paganism, there's, there's a, a lot of people that are really big fans of William Shakespeare. Um, in this community, especially. And there's a really cool tie to Shakespeare and uh, the dramatic period, especially the Iron Age, because that was when... So again, it is kind of a speculated topic, but the play that Shakespeare wrote about Beowulf was a fictional adaptation of what was a real person at one point. And we see that in modern stuff all the time, but it is a really cool connection between stuff that you still see in modern, modern day Shakespeare's plays have lasted forever and how one of his biggest and best works is tied directly to the rise of the iron and or Viking age in the North. And that's, that's a cool fact. Right. Cause it goes in to speak about how, um, there was evidence of the King's attachment, um, because in modern day, it's along the coastal regions of the Netherlands, um, yep. which ties it in to, you know, in that period, it wasn't part of the modern um, Netherlands, but now it is. Yeah. So it just kind of shows how the blend happened there as well. Yeah. And how, how the lay of the land changed over time and repeatedly. And yep. that's, that's a really cool thing. Um, Beowulf... When you get into the poetic eddas, there is actually, and I'm going to have to find it here again, guys, so give me a moment. Oh, I have no idea how to pronounce that. But there's a, a story in the poetic eddas. Uh, Locusina? Yes, Locusina, thank you. Um, where they actually tell the story of everybody meeting in the Great Hall, and Beowulf is present for that. And... Again, it's just a really cool tie 
to some modern stuff that's still going on because like I say we're we're still being taught Shakespeare's plays and there's still modern stuff being made about Beowulf and it's it's just a really cool attachment to the past. Right. Which, it, again, I love how it talks about how um, they believe that the heathens know Beowulf is fictional, but they can look at some supporting evidence of the earlier yes. practices that continued into the Viking Age and to become accepted as modern practices. Exactly. Um, which is really cool because uh, that just kind of shows you that um, some of those things were present in some of Shakespeare's work. Yeah. Um, especially in Beowulf. Yeah. I mean, even though it was fictional, um, it had some factual aspects to it. Absolutely. And again, that's something that we still see in modern storytelling. You take a hero oh, or definitely. a character of importance in your community and, you know, you tell stories about them. And it, it's really cool to see how long it's lasted with this particular, um, with Beowulf. Yeah, no, I, I love how she tied Beowulf into the history section of it. Because um, some of that was stuff I didn't even know. Um, yeah. Um, and then next, so, the book goes into the conversion period, um, yeah. which they believe to have begun around 300 CE. Um, and it ends roughly in 100 CE, or 1000 yeah. CE, sorry. Um, and it mirrors the Germanic Iron Age and the early part of the Viking Age, is what it yeah. uh, talks about, is how um, the Iron Age led into the Viking Age. Yeah, and again, that goes exactly back to talking about how the adaptation of the Iron Age it, it furthered everybody's reach. You know what I mean, and that's and when you when you go back into and to modern storytellings, when you, ever somebody's talking about the Viking Age, it's always, you know, sailing west. Every story you see is about sailing west and the encounters between Christianity and the Northmen, and right. they in history they line up perfectly, and that's that's again another really cool historical fact. Right, and I, I find it funny that like a lot of the focus has been on when they're sailing west, and people forget that, that before they even sailed west, they sailed south yes. and east. And yeah, um, and you hit you hit that right on the head, and that leads that leads right into the next paragraph where they coin the term Viking, and how and and me and me and Redbeard had a really good talk about this, and we've had several really good talks about this about how cool it is that. It wasn't the Northmen that named themselves Viking. It was their, it was their content with with the West, or contact contact with the West. I should say sorry. When it was those people that coined the Raiders the Viking, and um, it leads up to the first historically, and again, that's really important. What Randy just said is. The first recorded raid by the Northmen in Abbey, and that was June 8th, 793 CE, was the first recorded raid. And then I, we wanted to make sure that we, we really address that in this part of the book. And that's why Randy just said, you got to remember that for a very long time, the Northmen were raiding east and they were raiding south and they weren't. It, none of that was really recorded because none of those tribes had recorded written documents at that time. They didn't save language. It was still a very much hunter-gatherer style kind of a lifestyle here compared right. to the different social construction that was happening in the West. And that's why there was such a clash when the two did meet and the raids did start um, going West. Oh, definitely. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, and, you know, it also goes into, um, besides that aspect of it, um, like when he was talking about the Vike and the Viking um, name that came yeah. um, from that time period, uh, one thing to remember, you guys, is Vike and Viking were in occupation. They yeah. weren't uh, the North, Norse, they weren't all Norsemen. It was an occupation of a Norseman. Um, most Norsemen were farmers and cattle raisers. Um, and most of what they were doing was trying to acquire new lands to keep growth of their different um, tribes. Yeah. 
And so the Westerners' view of the Northmen were of these these longboats and these Vikings. You know what I mean? They they didn't see the rest of the culture. They didn't see the rest of how their social constructs existed. To what they saw were just the raiders. It was the Viking. You know what I mean? And that's that became ingrained as in history and still continues to this day. Right, because I know a lot of people just like like to use the phrase and refer to themselves as Vikings and everything like that. And the thing we got to remember, guys, is, you know, the, the phrase Viking actually refers to an occupation. Yeah. Or an action. Yeah, it, it's not an actual name of all Norish. Yeah. And so that leads into kind of modern practices now. I, again, because it was so culturally significant, these these raiders showing up on the coast and what took place after that and the tales and the stories most modern heathens pull their faith based on that particular era in norse paganism right it was the viking age in particular that a lot of people focus on Um, right and again that carries into today but we do have to remember and there's a great line here um no part in history exists in a vacuum. And that is such a, a, an important statement because we as practicing heathens are almost foolish to only look at this specific, what is a very small sliver in time compared to the time frames we talked about tonight and the amount right. of knowledge and practice that exists on both other sides of that. So as, as awesome as this is and as important as this part of history is, it's important that we remember it is not everything. Right. And you guys got to remember the whole reason, like, and I loved um, how, like, when you first start reading this chapter and you're going through it and it's talking about the eras before, um, the actual Norse eras and the eras leading into um the nordic age um the viking age and everything um what i love is at the end um there's a phrase where she talks about uh what was it exactly i want to make sure i get it right uh it's vital to remember the past in itself but also that a past has a past and that's why kind of we're looking into our past, but to understand our past, we need to understand our past is past. Yeah. And that's why she goes into a lot that had to do before the era and how the era got led up to. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like looking at the roots of a tree. You know what I mean? You see roots on the surface that you, you can always see the tree spreading out, but there's so much more underneath it that you don't see unless you really go looking for it. And that's, I mean, you get into the symbolism of Yadrasil and all that kind of stuff, which is, again, another reference to, to that. And it's, it's, it's important. It's super important. So then the last two pages, you guys, in um, this chapter um, that we go into next is going to be connecting the sun um, and meditation on Suna. And then uh, just kind of the next page over is other practices, which just teaches, it gives you um, a generic form of how to do an offering um, for this specific God. Um, But it also lets you know in that part how um, you can apply it to the different gods by just changing a few aspects of it, Um, that you can use it as pretty much an outline. Um, especially for somebody that's new, uh, which is why I wanted to talk about these last two pages because it was because of this chapter in the book um, that I learned how to do and I did my first offering, and that was the Suna. Um, and it was through reading this chapter and seeing it put forth of how to do it because I had no clue. I was still really new. Yeah. So, and, you know, we all know that there hasn't been, even though there's a lot of us, there hasn't been a lot of avenues even between us to go to learn these things. Um, and that's one of the reasons that it's so important that we're going over this stuff um, and going over these books is so that people have that avenue. 
which is amazing. And that's where the book goes into uh, connecting with Suna. And I'm just going to read um, a, the last two paragraphs um, of that page where it just it goes in to visualize the sun's warmth as sunlight itself. As you breathe, imagine that the sun's light is permitting your muscles and helping them relax. Then visualize Suna. She is driving her cart across the sky. It is hard to see her past the sun's blaze in her chariot, but she is there. And as you watch, you can see her using the reins to guide her horse, the now familiar path across the skies. They move at a full gallop, although from the distance, it may seem like they are not moving at all. As much as the sun appears motionless as the earth rotates on its axis, you may call out her name, either out loud or as part of your visualization. Hail Suna. You cry as she passes. She turns her face to you and raises one hand in greeting. You slowly become aware of your own body. The sun's light fades and the sun's warmth is now outside of you. Inside you are aware you were self relaxed and somewhat energized from the sun's light. When you open your eyes, you are standing or sitting in some place, you, in the same place you started. Thank Suna for her time and head inside. If you are able, offer something up to Suna and thanks. This can be as simple as a favorite pebble or a splash of beer, mead, or apple cider offering to her by being spilled onto the ground. The idea is to form a uh, relationship with Suna by thanking her and giving her something, you acknowledge the gift she has given you. And I just, I loved those two paragraphs right there. Yeah. Well, you, you actually used these two paragraphs when you first started practicing, didn't you? Yes, I used these first two paragraphs um, to prepare myself. Mm -hmm. And then I used the next page, the other practices, to actually do my first offering, um, which I love because on the practices, it gives you kind of an outline of generic way to do offering, um, where it just talks about, again, uh, connect yourself with the rhythm um, and with the sun itself uh, when you're about to do this at sunset and as it fades. Um, and then a simple prayer to the sun can be made out of Valkyrie, I can't pronounce that word, to the hero cigar in the saga. So, and then it just goes into the prayer. Hail day and hail the sons of day. And hail Sana on her travels as well as you're making the prayer. And it goes over doing it uh, the numerous different times. Um, and then the simple voting and signs of the relationship you're developing with that guy. I mean, it kind of gives you a basic synopsis of how to make a, one of your first connections with yep. one of the gods of the old. Yep. And that's Which super, I just that's thought awesome. was really interesting. Yeah. And I honestly, until we came back to this book for this Norse talk, I didn't know that um, Randy had used this. And it's really cool to know that even in our own lives, because I go back to this book all the time. Like, the, the, uh, this is my handbook. If I'm generally curious about something... There's so much in here that we're going to go over that you get, and, and you guys are going to attach to different parts of it and you guys are going to have different values, but this is a very valuable book to start with. And it is super cool that um, Randy used that in, in one of his first offerings. Cause, how long have you been practicing, Randy? Um, I've been practicing for about six months. Six months. Yeah. See, so, and that's, that's, so, that's so cool. Cause that means that, I mean, your first offering wasn't, terribly long ago right it was it was probably about two months ago yeah that's cool um so kind of just wrapping up with the chapter here guys um the history and and looking to the past again with ancestor worship and how important it was to, to building the future this is is a really great chapter they talk about a lot of the different uh, time periods briefly and they tie them together really well. 
Um, well, and, and I love the way that it talks about the history because, you know, um, with anything, guys, you got to build a strong foundation first. Yeah. And the history is the foundation um, of the practices now. And that's where we're going to find how to practice, what to practice, and develop our own ways of practicing. Um, but we got to build that foundation first by learning about our past so that we can understand what our foundation is that's being built. Yeah. And if we remember the lesson that we learned from chapter one, when it talks about that exact thing, how modern heathenry is still in its young ages, you know what I mean? We're Definitely. It's still just starting to come around again. I mean, it's based on such a great, rich amount of information and practices and stuff, but it's just now rising up again. So there is a mass amount of people that are all looking into the past right now, trying to find themselves. We are all on this same journey. And it's it's so cool. And, and I know it gets into a little bit of controversy because so many of these books and so many of these practices differ from each other. Right. And, and can be explained differently, but they all come back to those same roots. And it it is really cool, again, that it's not just based on, on what, was recorded from our own culture, but that there was so much input from what other groups of people were seeing. You know what I mean? And that they all documented it differently too. And there's still new stuff coming to light. I mean, this the the chariot for Sunna, the, the chariot they found in the bog, that was only found in 1902. Right, yeah, I mean, so it's if, not if you, that long ago. It's not that long ago. You know what I mean? And they're just now looking at this kind of stuff with the modern technology and the modern advancements that we have to actually look and carbon date and figure out where some of this stuff is coming from and what it meant to the people around that in those areas and to the broader cultures around them. Because like we said before, the cultural basis and the social constructs on the continent from the beginning of the Bronze Age to the end of the Iron Age shifted dramatically. You know, you had the Romans that pushed so far into Germania. And oh, yeah. And you have, you have um, Mongolians on the other side during this entire massive time frame. Uh, the Egyptians as well. Like, there was massive, massive cultures in different states all coming together and interacting with each other during this, this time period. And it's, it's really cool. Well, and what a lot of people got to remember is also um, the roots of the Norse heritage go back a lot farther than what was ever documented yep. because it wasn't until it started getting documented that like it's the words got spread about it because everything else before that was handed down from family to family. Exactly. And you got to remember these regions were Nordic way before the Nordic was even a term. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's, known to the rest oh, sorry, of the world. Go ahead. Yeah. They're, they're still studying cave markings that they found from pre bronze era people that were left on, on walls. And again, this is all speculation, but a lot of, a lot of the characteristics or a lot of the images they have found are of a man with a spear. And right. there's a lot of debate going, well, was this Odin? Was this Tyr? You know, was this one of the elder Assyr gods at the very beginning? You know what I mean? And there's a lot of debate over that. It's not something that I, I would say, yes, this is this person. Yes, this is this person. Or yes, this is this deity. But the fact that there's so much rich information that goes back so far, we're just, we're just getting to the tip of the iceberg with it. Yeah, no, I love it. Like, that's like, this is a really good chapter. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I, I do enjoy history. Um, yeah. It is one of my things. Um, I love history. So for me, this is a really exciting chapter, uh, especially learning about the Beowulf aspect of it. Because I, I am, yeah. um, as a lot of people that know me know, I am a big Shakespeare fan. Um, I actually have a book with every single one of his works in it. Um, Beowulf just happens to be one I have not read. But just knowing that some of his works were included into this book um, or acknowledged in this book is what I meant to say. Were acknowledged in this book and tied to the area is just exciting for me. 
Well, and I mean, the Beowulf character, the actual character, Shakespeare's character, which was, again, based on aspects of a real person, that character itself is still used to shape a lot of modern entertainment characters. If you look at characters like uh, Geralt in the Witcher games and the TV show and the books that are out now, there are a lot of similarities between the internal qualities of Geralt's character and um, Beowulf. And even just right. the the descriptions of the land and the buildings and, and how people interacted with each other. There's a lot of similarities. Like it, it, it's a huge cultural phenomenon. And again, it all ties back to the past. It might be a little different and things change and things evolve, but it, it still pays respect to, to the old ways. It still shows, it still shines a light on the ancestors and that's that's amazing that's what it's about yeah and that's that's the thing we're going to learn um not only in this book but in future books you guys there's going to be so much that like you're going to come across if you haven't read one of these books like you know if you hadn't read this book before like i hadn't um you if you've already read it you knew about the Beowulf aspect but for those of us that are still new um, and we're building those kind of connections. And especially when it can be a film, familiar connection with something that you're passionate about. Um, yeah. It definitely heightens the experience of learning for you, which I think is amazing. And I think we'll find that throughout this whole journey through these different books. We'll find different aspects like that, that you just go, wow, that's amazing. Like, exactly. that's so my type of stuff. Um, and it just gives you another way to connect with the whole Norse history. And um, being a pagan. And so Randy just hit on a, on a really cool aspect of this. So next next week we're going into chapter three. And chapter three is going to be the descriptions of the different gods and deities. So when we do start going into that chapter, go into that chapter with that same curiosity and that same Beowulf theory. When we start reading the descriptions, and not just the Assyr gods, but some of the other less talked about deities look at the connections between some of those and not just other pagan beliefs but stuff that you're seeing in modern culture modern entertainment different characters a character that you might you might love that might be a beloved part of your life could very well have roots that you're not you're not even aware of yet and that can enhance it so much yeah it's it's amazing because i mean if you do think about it though um, if you think about like the Viking era during the raids and stuff, when they were raiding the European era, um, the Europeans over there, a lot of the way that a lot of Shakespeare's era came from that period. Yep. Um, and a lot of his characters are the way they are because that's how the soldiers and the people over in those areas were compared to how the Viking culture was. Well, and that ties back to this was, this was the, uh, you go into the, the iron age, the conversion era, all of these different things that were going on during the specific big, but in the long scheme of things, very small time frame. The adaptation of the Iron Age was a lot of groups of people's first ability to travel and move past the typical hunter-gatherer territory that a culture right. would stay in. So this was the first time in history on this continent where massive cultures and massive different backgrounds we're meeting each other for the first time and we're beginning to start interacting with each other and forming those different social bonds with, with cultures that were completely different than their own. And it is so rich in storytelling and, and I mean, everybody's favorite tale, most of everybody's favorite tale comes from that era and is culturally specific to what they're interested in, but everything comes back to this one period in time where people started coming together. And we are seeing, and I'm, I'm going to get a little sappy here, we are seeing that again now in our age with our ability to talk to anybody on the planet face-to-face, -face, video to video, in rooms like this, virtually. You know, with without this adaptation and this technology and this move forward none of us would be here together right and you're seeing you're seeing the the norse culture in our rooms using that to again enrich the community and you guys are all a part of that and that's so fucking cool 
That's so cool. <laughs> well, and, and you know, one, one aspect that I find funny when you're looking at the Europeans versus um, the Norsemen and the Vikings um, in the Viking mm -hmm. era and how they used to lift. Now, you got to remember, you know, the Vikings lived in houses and huts and on farms and stuff like that. And then they go to raid these areas that have castles. Yeah. So, of course, when you've got a castle and a working um, indoors of the castle and everything, the whole foyer and stuff where people are doing all the trading and the merchandise and everything like that. And you've got that whole system going. And then you've got these people that are still living in, in huts and dugouts and living in houses um, that don't have anything like that. Of course, they look like barbarian, heathens, Vikings to them yeah. because they, they look like they were more savage than what the Christian culture believed themselves to be. Well, and, the, and their value bases were, were, were completely different. The, the, reason, the reasons why when everybody started hitting and raiding along the West Coast, they were coming back with such big scores is because they were attacking the monasteries. They were attacking these small places where the culture in the UK and, and, and the islands at that point were, those were sacred places. Those didn't need to be protected because they were protected by their faith. You know, so when the raids started happening, these they were seen as godless heathens because they would target these places with no regard because they were there for them, you know, like they were along the coastline, they were outside of the city limits, they were monasteries, there were places where people were um, scribing the first books and stuff like that and spreading and it was during a time where Latin was kind of fading out of, of the, the faith based practice back then there was a lot of development just in Christianity during that period of time. And then all of a sudden these Northmen are showing up on the shores and annihilating these places and taking everything for their own like it was well right and you you guys got to remember as well it's like the reason that the vikings looked so big um to the europeans and everything was because they were hard-working farmers everything um doing a lot of physical stuff that made that their body tone bigger um where a lot of in the european areas um a lot of the knights and everything were of people of money, um, yeah. you know, that knew how, how to fight, but like that was the basis of what they did was learn how to fight. So like yeah. the, the difference in the size comparison, a lot just comes to the way that the civilizations were. And, and long term too, because a lot of the first developing people in around the UK and on the West coast there were of Roman Greek well, not not entirely, but there was a lot of Roman and Greek people that had migrated up into that area, and that was a complete. That goes back to the beginning of the Roman age and a completely different kind of lifestyle. Right. It, yeah, it, it's it's just cool that that you guys can like by reading stuff like this, you guys can see how all that ties in, and um, how the Europeans' views of the Norsemen would be a little bit skewed in their direction because basically they look scary to them. <laughs> yeah. And you got to remember on the West coast, Christianity was already very, very well embedded, right? The, the idealism of offerings and back then, which were still real sacrifices were com were seen as completely different from what their more their more community and interdependent social construct was. You know, their community was working different and together underneath the church. You know what I mean? Like it was a different style of living. And so when these people arrived with a, a complete disregard and a completely different style of living that was a big culture shock for everybody. Well, and that also ties into the fact that, you know, the reason that the uh, Norse or the Nor the paganism era um, with the Norsemen and everything seems like it was such a short era is because it didn't start get document, didn't start getting documented until they started going West. And you got to remember once they started going West was also uh, 
is when the depletion of the number of Vikings and Norsemen started coming because of the conversions from them going to us. Yeah. And that's when the era, so it picked up, like most documentation picked up shortly before the era where the conversions started to happen. So that's why the era seems so short. So we're, we're going to be moving into question and answer period here pretty quick. And Randy just hit on something that, that popped a question into my head. And so I'm going to ask it of both the rooms to participate. Out of the different Norse and Norish Northmen territories, which was the last to be affected by the conversion? So when we get into question and answer period, it is in this chapter. So if, if you have an answer for it, when we get to question and answers, it, it's giving you a reason to jump in. That's awesome. But we are going to wrap this up for tonight, you guys. Um, remember, Friday is the Halloween costume contest. Um, we've had a few submissions, but we haven't had a lot, so we just decided what we're going to do. Keep submitting them between now and Friday. Anybody that's in the room on Friday that has a costume on that wants to jump in the box and show it off, they are more than welcome to, and we're going to play it that way. And then we'll still vote um, within the room, and whoever wins the competition will get a Woodburn coaster uh, of a compass on one side and it'll say Norse Talk on the other. Yeah. So um, everybody in my room, we're going to be moving into question and answer period. And if you guys were here last week, you, you know what we're about to do. We To use question and answers, we got to have the box. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be ending my live and jumping in as a guest on Redbeards. Okay. So if you guys... Um, want to participate in question and answers that's going to be the place to go and again i still have the discord open so if you can't go live and you don't want to ask your question in here for whatever reason pop it into the discord and i will address it for you great so, um, so then next we... week oh go sorry ahead. um you're going to end as well for a brief second right just so that you can move the file or are we just going to jump right oh in? no i'll just keep recording i'll just edit it okay cool okay beautiful Okay, so I'll get everybody to jump or start making their way over to Redbeard's uh, room just so that when I end, you don't get tossed into TikTok right. land. So then next week, you guys, we will be uh, breaking Chapter 3 into Monday and Wednesday. Um, and what we're going to do is we'll split the uh, chapter in equal pages. So in the meantime, I want you guys to go through the first half and the second half and pick five gods you guys want to focus on. We will do a brief touch on the other ones um, and we'll discuss whatever five most people want us to um, for the most chapter or for that chap uh, half of the chapter. That way we can focus on what people want to hear about. Um, because if we went through, if we went through every God and deity in there um, specifically and talked about them, we would be on this chapter for probably three or four weeks. Yeah, it is a massive chapter and it is a super detailed you if you if you guys haven't made it into chapter three yet pick the book up when we're done start making your way through it it is going to grab you because there it is an amazing chapter the descriptions yep. of the different deities and their interactions with each other and pay close attention to the family and bond aspects of how the different lesser lesser known deities work with the more well-known ones and see if you can connect that to ancestor worship and how community and family was important to the Northmen and the North people. So anyways, guys, I'm going to jump out and then I'm going to jump over to Redbeard's live. So again, there's only, yeah, just my moderators are in here right now. Yep. So we're going to jump over to a Q and a, you guys. So we're going to end this episode real quick. Um, we will just do the sign off um, and then he'll jump out and we'll go into the boxes. So once again, you guys, uh, be prepared for the Halloween contest on Friday. Um, if you don't get a chance to get your submission in before then and you want to jump in the box and show your costume off, you are more than welcome to. Um, we want to see as many costumes as possible on Friday night in the boxes. Let you guys talk a little bit about yourself and uh, your experience as being Norish. Uh, maybe about the book if you like. And then also, um, if you want to plug your page a little bit, you can do that as well. Yeah. So... We're going to sign off for now, you guys, and jump into Q&A. So you guys stay amazing, creating, and always be awesome. And you guys remember, this is a we thing, not a me thing, not a him thing. We can't do this without you guys. 
So please don't forget to check out our Instagram. Don't forget to check out the cord and those three support pages so that we can keep this going, you guys. Any one of those three links at the top on the beacons on my page, you'll find all that stuff, you guys. So once again, we will see you guys in question and answer.